This portion of the presentation on risk and return discusses the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM, developed back in the early 60s by Sharp, Trainer, Lintner, and Mosin, and actually deals with the valuation of individual assets that are held in a well-diversified portfolio. This discussion proceeds from the earlier one on the capital market line, which if I may go back here on the PowerPoint slide is actually this light blue line coming from the y-intercept where we regressed uh, where we looked at the relationship between the expected rate of return on an efficient portfolio and the risk of that portfolio defined by this model right here. So this model is telling us that the expected return on an efficient portfolio which is a portfolio lying on the efficient frontier is equal to the risk-free interest rate right here, this term right here, plus this entire term here, which is the risk premium of the portfolio consisting of this numerator here, which is the market risk premium expressed as a percentage of the standard deviation of the market, and then this term multiplied by the standard deviation of the portfolio. So this capital market line specifies the relationship between risk measured by the standard deviation of the portfolio and return of that efficient portfolio. However, rational investors and portfolio managers are particularly concerned about the relationship between risk and return for individual assets that may be held as part of this diversified portfolio. And so for that, we proceed back to our study of the CAPM. Now though, the notion of risk here is important because the CAPM argues that not all risks of an asset are relevant if that asset is held in a diversified portfolio. It shows that there are two types of risk, diversifiable risk and non-diversifiable risk. This non-diversifiable, uh, sorry, this diversifiable risk is the portion of the risk of a stock that can be eliminated when that stock is held in a diversified portfolio and therefore such diversifiable risk which are unsystematic in nature are firm specific. Examples could be labor strikes associated with a particular firm, legal problems, uh, product recall problems, indeed any risks that are unique or specific to the underlying firm. Those risks can be diversified away if you hold the stock of that firm in a well-diversified portfolio. Regardless, you would still be exposed to undiversifiable risk, aka systematic risk or market risk, such as the risks associated with price shocks, inflation, uh, recessions, acts of nature like natural hazards, and of course geopolitical risk. So the deal here is that since company specific risks can be diversified away that investors would be rewarded only for market risk, only for the systematic risk that they take on in the stocks that they select. So now the deal here is, since if I go back here, since we can get rid of diversifiable risk and are only exposed to non-diversifiable risk, or if you like, undiversifiable risk, how can we then measure this undiversifiable risk that we still have to be settled with? The answer is beta. That is our measure of systematic risk, which is undiversifiable. Empirically speaking, we obtain that as the slope of this market model regression, where the return on a stock represents the dependent variable, which in statistics you may call the Y variable and RM here would be the return on the market as a whole which is a which captures the plurality of overall economic performance
and so this beta here which is the slope of this regression line would measure the degree to which the rich, this stock will change with respect to changes in the market and therefore would serve as our beta estimates. To show an example, I go to the spreadsheet right here. And here I collected data for S&P 500, a good proxy for the market as a whole. It's a value-weighted index and the stock IBM. And I'm going to calculate the return. These are monthly data, by the way, from 1990 to 2015. And using these, I calculate the rates of return. If I hit F2 here, you'll see I'm using the logarithmic form, natural log of the most current price divided by the preceding month's price, ditto for that of IBM. Now with these, and given that my market return is the independent variable X, while the stock return is the dependent variable Y, and rightly so because we're concerned about how volatile this stock is with respect to the overall economy proxied by the market index. I'm going to run a regression. To do so, go to Data, Data Analysis, select Regression, which is already selected, OK it. Okay, I'm just going to clean this out. These are things I already did before. All right, so starting out, I click right here while cursor is blinking there it says input Y so my Y is IBM I'm gonna start from IBM just one row of label is required highlight it all click here for input X and then I'm gonna go back up here to the top of the file start from S&P 500 again only one row of um, label is required highlight that now check labels here so the computer knows the first row contains label click here for output and then click right here so that as your cursor is blinking there click out here on the body of the spreadsheet where you have a space going down and to the right and then click OK and that's your output which I did earlier on and this is a cleaner uh, more formatted uh, data output now to show the interpretation of the results the most important thing here is your F statistic, which here is almost 130. The p-value here is a measure of the significance of this number. If this number is less than 0.05, then we conclude that the regression as a whole is statistically significant at the 5% level. In this case, actually, it is significant at the 1% level, 0.01, because this, all, this is all zero, which is less than 0.01. So this is telling us that the regression relationship between IBM and the markets as a whole is statistically significant. A good thing. Next, we look at our slope estimate, which here comes out to be pretty much 1. So I'm going to highlight that because this is the most important output here. This is our estimate for, of beta of this stock, IBM. And what this is telling us is that IBM stock is virtually as volatile as the market because its beta is pretty much 1. Now additional output here that may be of interest would include this multiple R, which is actually the correlation coefficient. Remember, correlation coefficient is a measure of association and tells us if two things move together and if so, to what degree. And in this case, they move. Uh, it ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. So this is 0.55 approximately for what it's worth. R square is quite important. It's approximately 0.3 or 30 percent. It is called coefficient of determination and uh, measures the explanatory power of the regression. Specifically, it tells us what proportion of the total variation in the stock IBM that has been explained by the markets. And in this analysis, it tells us that approximately 30 percent of the variation of the movements in IBM stock is explained by the overall market movement. The remaining 70 percent is on account of other company-specific factors, so to speak. Another is standard error of the estimates, which is a measure of the unexplained variation, but this is an absolute number. It's not a percentage. And of course, the sample size is 307 monthly observations. 
So going back here to our PowerPoint presentation, I summarize that if your beta is 1, which is actually the, mar the beta of the market, then the stock is as risky as the market. If it's 2, then it tells us the stock is twice as volatile as the market. So if you like, twice as risky as the market. If it's negative 2, yes, it is tw it's twice as volatile as the market, but the stock's volatility moves in the opposite direction to that of the market. Of course, if it is 0, then the stock has no systematic risk, in which case the stock's expected return can be can be expected, if I may use that term one more time, to be equal to that of a risk-free asset, an asset with no risk. And once again, this is a copyover of the regression output to your PowerPoint presentation. And finally, this is a summary of the interpretation of the regression output that we just went over. Now I also show here that beta can be calculated directly as the equal to the ratio of the covariance of the stock's return and that of the market and the variance of the market. I show it here on the spreadsheet. Right here at the bottom of this file. First I calculate the covariance of the return on the market and that of the stock. If I hit F2, you will see the, the function, the spreadsheet function, and you'll see the input data. And here, this is the variance of the market. F2 will show the input data. And for beta, if I click there, I hit F2, it simply is the ratio of this blue cell and this red cell here. That's what you see right here. As you can see, it's precisely the same thing. And finally here, we can also calculate the, the beta of a portfolio of stocks. It simply is the weighted average of the betas of the individual stocks, as I show here in this general definition. So after the betas of individual stocks have been obtained, we can calculate the beta of the portfolio. i show you a quick example here. Here we have a portfolio of five stocks, and these are the, as the betas of the stocks. We have invested 20% of our money into stock 1, 30% in stock 2, 15% in stock 3, 25% in stock 4, and 10% in stock 5. The total of this should be 100%, which is 1. So plug and play. And we find here that after all is said and done, the weighted average of the betas of these stocks comes out to be a little over 1. So when, all, when put together, this portfolio is slightly more volatile than the market portfolio. And this concludes this section of the presentation.